Real quick, think about how you found out about this podcast. Maybe someone tweeted it out, you saw it shared on LinkedIn, or someone sent it to you directly. Something like that. Well, that's how this podcast grows, through word of mouth. So no matter how you found it, if you could share it with someone new, it would mean the world to me. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. All right, we're trying something new here, folks. I've got five seasons and 60 brilliant episodes, and I thought it would be fun in the off season to go back to the archives and highlight some past conversations. So using my trusty random number generator, I've chosen an episode at random. And so now we're going to go back to 2018 to my conversation with John Alberg, co-founder of Euclidean Technologies, where machine learning is applied to the value investing problem. The part I'm highlighting here starts around minute 20 of that episode and is about the formulation of the machine learning problem and how the research question should be asked. I like this section because I think it really highlights how we can think about the trade-off of degrees of complexity versus accuracy and the problem of overfitting. Enjoy. When you think of the degrees of difficulty of the problem as well, when you say, I'm going to predict a specific return, right? Well, let's take it another way. I think stock A is going to outperform stock B is orders of magnitude less complex than I think stock A is going to outperform stock B by 5%, which is orders of magnitude less complex than I think stock A is going to return 22% and stock B is going to return 17%. And your confidence in the former can be incredibly high. And while they all might technically say the same thing, they all agree you know, they'll all be true at the same time. One of those is far, far easier ultimately to model, or you would expect it to be far, far easier to model. And your confidence in that model would be much higher than the latter due to the accuracy required. So as I mentioned, we formulated the challenge of applying machine learning to long-term investing as a classification problem, as opposed to a regression problem, meaning that we said we want the model to tell us, hey, this looks like a good long-term investment instead of the model saying, you know, this stock will return 20% above the market over the next year. And the reason we took this approach is for the same reasons that you're mentioning, that it just seems like a more tractable problem. And as it turns out, empirically, this is the case. You can do quite well if you pose problem of long-term investing in this way. Now, That being said, with the advent of deep learning and observing that it has been successful on some very challenging problems where there's lots of noise and the signal needs to be kind of teased out of it, we started to reinvestigate whether deep learning could be successfully used to forecast excess returns. And what we found was that deep neural networks were essentially no better than linear regression at this problem, that Now, that doesn't mean that they can't forecast excess returns, as linear regression actually does have some predictive power in forecasting. That is essentially why something like the value effect or the momentum effect exists. There is a relationship between those factors and the excess return of a stock. It's just that that relationship is best modeled with a linear model. There's Occam's razor, don't use a model that's any more complex than it needs to be. But in this process, we also started to ask the question, well, if we can't forecast prices with a deep neural network, maybe we can forecast something else. And borrowing on the idea of sequence learning and language translation and other uses of recurrent neural networks, we explored whether you could use a sequence of historical financial statements to forecast future financials or future fundamentals. And it is in this area that we've had a good degree of success with deep neural networks. So I read a paper this morning, 
and I'm forgetting the exact title, but it was something to the effect of deep alpha. And it was this idea of using a deep neural network for the very reasons you mentioned, which is there doesn't need to be any preemptive feature engineering. You can feed it this raw data. And one of the added benefits of using this deep neural network is the opportunity to identify nonlinear features that very often a lot of the features we pre-engineer are very linear in nature, identifying nonlinear relationships in the data and allowing that to flow through the deep neural network in the classification problem was their way of trying to identify unique sources of alpha. But to a lay person like me who is not incredibly sophisticated in the realm of machine learning, this sounds a whole lot like it's just overfitting the data, that there is a massive risk of just passing all of this information in and letting the model identify that information, which was most predictive in the past, but perhaps it is just identifying nothingness and noise, that there's a lot of spurious relationships that it's uncovering. Talk me through, particularly with something like a deep neural network where they are entirely opaque and a lot of the reason within the model is hidden deep in the layers how do you gain confidence that you're not overfitting? And I want to say I almost find it ironic because you didn't start using deep neural networks until the last couple of years, but you actually wrote a piece very early on at Euclidean about how you gain confidence in a machine learning approach. And so maybe that you can tie that in sort of the criteria you outlined. But how do you think about gaining confidence in an approach in which by definition there's an extreme lack of transparency? It may sound like overfitting, but in this case, it's not. I think it's worthwhile to clarify the relationship between machine learning and overfitting. The fitting of data is, in fact, a spectrum going from underfit to overfit. And somewhere in the middle there is a point that is like this Goldilocks point where you're not too underfit and you're not too overfit. This is the point where a model is said to optimally generalize the relationship in the training data to the out-of-sample data. The tools of machine learning like regularization, cross-validation, and holdout testing are designed to allow you to navigate the spectrum so that you can find this Goldilocks point of generalization. So take computer vision as an example where there's been a lot of success with deep neural networks. There's a tremendous amount of noise in images. We don't notice how extreme it is because our brains are so good at converting a field of pixels into recognizable objects. But just imagine the diversity of pixels and pixel combinations that exist in a photo of something like an Arabian bazaar. Then imagine how those combinations multiply as lighting changes throughout the day. So how is it possible that we are able to build perceptual systems that are able to visually navigate a self-driving car? Wouldn't those perceptual systems just overfit the noise in all that video? The answer is regularization. Without it, we would have none of the successes we see with neural networks today. Now, there is this relationship between the complexity of a model, and again, deep neural networks are very complex, and how much data we have for a given problem. The more complex the model, the more data you need. And I've heard this argument that in finance, there just isn't enough data to support the complexity of a deep neural network as there is with computer vision. But in this particular problem, forecasting future fundamentals from historic fundamentals, there is actually plenty of data. So we can do the math. If, we, if we're interested in five-year time series, then if that's a data point, then how many five-year time series on company fundamentals are there? If we use a sample historic period to learn from of 35 years, and assume we have approximately 2,500 companies at each given time, and that we're looking at monthly data. If you multiply those three numbers together, we have close to a million unique time series to learn from, which is plenty for the purpose of deep learning. Now, there are aspects of financial data that can make learning, and any kind of inference for that matter, challenging. So like any problem, we have this issue when learning of trying to infer a distribution from only a sample of data. And we're successful if we're able to infer that relationship from the data on out-of-sample data. 
But because the time dimensionality of financial data, the underlying true distribution that we're trying to learn can change. You know, that is, this distribution can be what's called non-stationary, so that whatever you learn in one time period may not be true in the next time period. You absolutely read my mind, because this is exactly where I wanted to go next. This discussion of machine learning seems incredibly well-suited for data sets that are implicitly stationary, as you mentioned. And it seems to have made huge advancements in areas where there are well-defined rules or, or games where there's ultimately defined boundaries. So Go is an incredibly complex game, but there are ultimately governing rules. If you ascribe to someone like Andrew Lowe's adaptive market hypothesis, the degree of competition within the market is ultimately in some way changing the rules. And in many ways, the rules have changed over time. The way, for example, that CFOs may report financials has changed over time. How do you tackle this issue of non-stationarity in the data? And, and maybe just more generally, is machine learning applicable in, in finance at all? Sure, but this is not so much an issue with machine learning, but rather a question of when and where inference can be done at all. If you have extremely non-stationary data where the distribution is constantly changing from one period to the next, then any statistical description of the data in prior time periods of no real value in the next. Now, there are tools that can be employed if you have non-stationary data that is slowly changing through time. And that is to iteratively build models, be it a linear regression or a neural network, that use data from a fixed trailing window of time to forecast into the current or next time period. So let's say you believe that your distribution is relatively stable over a four month period. Then if you want to make forecasts for April, you build a model on data from January through March and use that model to make your April forecasts. And then you repeat this process for forecasts in May by building a model on data from the period February through April. And you can see how you can just iterate this approach out on forever. We do a form of, of this at Euclidean when we're forecasting fundamentals, but our time window is closer to 20 years than four months. And this gets to the point of why you, at Euclidean we focus on long-term value investing or fundamental investing because it's a more stationary problem than other types of investing. I mean, it's pretty well understood that the value of an asset is its future cash flows discounted to present value. And that's true, was true in 1925. It was also true in 2007. It's true in 2018, and it will be true in 2050. Therefore, if we can forecast cash flows in the, in the future with any degree of accuracy, you should have, a, have an investment approach that would work well over the long run. Whatever forecasting model is that is, it should be valuable regardless of what decade it's being used in. So one of the things we've touched upon here, one of the, the benefits potentially of a deep neural network is that you don't have to pre-engineer your factors. But in many ways, it strikes me that what makes someone a quant value investor is that pre-engineering in a certain way, that the factors that they are, by definition, looking at have to do with valuation. So they might be looking at price to book. They might be looking at enterprise value to EBITDA. It strikes me that when you just provide all the raw input to the deep neural network, maybe it's how you ask the question of the deep neural network that ultimately makes you a value investor. So I guess the question I would pose to you is if, if you're passing in all this raw data, what is it necessarily that connects you to the history of value investing that, that would make you say that you're applying machine learning to value investing? Well, what we really are is long-term fundamental investors, meaning that at any point in time, all I want to know is all of the publicly available information about a company that can be found in its historical financials or other documents that are filed with the SEC or published online. And all I want to assess is whether 
this company is going to be a good long-term investment or not. Now, the reality is that when you train any kind of model with that setup, it'll inevitably come up with a model that is characteristically value in nature. And that is just because of the strength of the value effect in the data. It's embedded in the combination of base economic principles of mean reversion and human behavioral biases, which create the effect, and therefore it's existed for a very, very long time and will continue to exist. Now, with a value model, there is, of course, value investments, good value investments, and there are also value traps. And I think that is where machine learning really shows its power and its ability to use nonlinearity to discriminate within the universe of value between companies that are true value opportunities and those companies that are just deservedly cheap. I hope you enjoyed this dive into the archives. If you did, leave us a rating or review and share with a friend. It helps us grow and it means the world. Thanks for listening.